All right, guys, welcome back to the Mental Sweat Show. We have a very special guest on today, a big guest, one of our biggest guests we've had so far, uh, my colleague at work, as well as one of my friends, uh, the Mike Yam. Welcome to the pod. Yeah, we got we got to start stepping up the game here. If I am like a high bar, then then we got to raise this bar up. Come on now, like I know there's a like. How are you guys not had like Phil Knight on? I you know like let's let's dip into the Oregon, uh, you know, kind of Rolodex here and 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 get this thing going. We're uh, we're working through the list slowly. We're getting there, <laughs> getting there day by yeah. day. Yeah, it's a little tough. Cristobal to hop on. He's he's on the back end of this episode. <laughs> By the way, yeah, I'll, I'll he... tease it, and you guys will take the re- have the uh, <laughs> have the heat when it doesn't happen. Right, exactly. right. But yeah, Ryan, uh, how about you kick us off here? I know we got some juicy questions for you, Mike. Yeah, so just uh, kind of going through your career path, you know, you've had a had an interesting journey through the sports media world. You know, kind of starting out in radio, and then going to NBA, and then ES- climbing up the ESPN ranks, then Pac-12, and now NFL. Obviously, you know, so kind of. Talk a little bit about your journey through uh, through the sports media and how that's kind of gone for you to where you're at now. Yeah, Ryan, it is. It really is wild. The more I reflect on the path and the opportunities that have come my way, it's sort of I still shake my head sometimes and go like, how the heck did this even even happen? Um, you know, you made reference to the NBA stuff like I almost it's been so long you know, but I do flash back to, you know, just being in Secaucus before Turner took over and being a part of that NBA TV crew and um, having a ton of fun really starting in fantasy. And the wild thing is, you know, I, I still get to talk to a lot of students who want to go down this path. And I always tell them like, hey, there's not a set, set path. You know, Nate, you and I, you know, have gone back and forth on this. And Ryan, like I, I got to college. I went to Fordham in New York. Like I was pre-med when I got there. I wanted to be a pediatrician my entire life. This sports thing, I didn't even really truly know that it was an actual job, which I know some people are like, how does that even make sense? Did you not watch sports? But And I did. I played all the sports. I watched sports. But I never really saw broadcasters who look like me and you know it just didn't really exist so I I never really put two and two together and then you know when I got to high school I went to uh, an all-boys Catholic high school in New Jersey called Bergen Catholic and I had a a teacher who sort of said like hey you got a good voice you ever think about doing broadcast I'm like like like, what does that even mean? Like, what are you talking about, dude? And uh, I was like, no, I want to be a doctor. And then it sort of like put a bug in my head. And when I got to Fordham, I, I wasn't long for the pre-med thing. Like I, that lasted a semester and I joined the radio station, started doing sports. And we had credentials to like the Knicks and the Mets and the Giants and the Jets, like all the New York teams. So I got to cover, you know, pro teams in New York, got to do things like the U.S. Open, uh, golf and tennis. And you just get all these really cool events and, it, I, you know, kind of caught that bug and you know ryan i just had people say yes to me which is just wild when i think back to the opportunities that came my way um i I have no idea why people took an interest in me i I really don't and to this day just so grateful to a lot of mentors a lot of people who would like go over my tape and give me feedback on my reels it's just it's wild man that's probably like the longest winded answer and and hopefully i like answered your question but it's it's crazy man just to think and reflect back on on the career path yeah that's awesome um that but now kind of how we cross paths before we actually knew each other we want to talk about the pac-12 you know we we came off the field you know we saw you like interviewing people where they're calling highlights when you, you know pac-12 after dark so how about we talk about our our pac-12 history together because i know it's been a kind of a long ride to where you are now at the NFL. All right. You guys got a real deal. This for me, I've always wanted to know this. Okay. Cause I was at PAC 12 network when we launched. And then in 2020, I lost my gig. They, you know, the COVID stuff and they cleaned house and you know, they, I thought I was getting a contract renewal and a month later, they're like, yo, peace out. You're done. And, uh, <laughs> but like, you know, so it was tough for me from like an emotional standpoint, but now that I'm removed from it, I always think back to the audience, right? Like, there were Pac-12 fans, and now knowing that there's two schools left and it's kind of criminal to see how this thing has has sort of netted out, I, I think back, like, did you guys watch? Like, when you were in school, like, I had no idea. Like, it was, I always felt like it was alumni, but did you guys actually know what the heck was going on on the network? Did you guys even get the network on campus? I'll say I I did not at my college house that I lived in, but you know, okay. being from Eugene, I would go to my parents' house and 
usually Pac-12 Network would be on on Saturday nights after games. You know, you would be on on, on doing the highlights and whatnot. But so unless if I was at my parents' house, no, I probably was not watching the Pac-12 Network. But um, That's yeah, wild. it was it was definitely a thing in my household, you know, being a, a West Coast person. Yeah, I will say in our locker room, though, we have those big TVs. And if ESPN wasn't on, it was Pac-12. So, I mean, it was one place to get all the highlights because you know how ESPN is. Like, especially the Pac-12 after dark, they're already playing, like, all the highlights of the game. And they're not showing, like, Arizona versus USC at 9 p.m. on the East Coast. Like, they're not showing those highlights. So, definitely would watch those. And, obviously, we had, like, a relationship with all you guys because you guys would always do our game. So, you know, it's interesting, too, because I do think back. First of all, your guys' locker rooms were amazing. I remember Ifo um, had given me a tour. It was just like when the facility was sort of opening the new locker rooms, like the Ferrari leather. And, you, I, you, like, it got to the point, like, I have a bottle. Like, I wouldn't put, like, a bottle down. Like, it was just just immaculate, just sort of the crazy uh, aspect of, of the facilities that were there. But it is, um, it's definitely wild. And to your point, like it was always just kind of ownership over the content because, you know, ESPN, you, you watch their late night highlights. I mean, it was, first of all, holistically, they did need to cover everyone, right? Like, so there was an idea of covering all the Power Five conferences. So like that was going to happen, but never really felt like West Coast football was really giving you know, really got its got its due in a big way. So we just kind of wanted to own a lot of that aspect. And and now when I think you see things that are rapidly changing, right? Like, you know, last week um, at NFL Network, we're getting ready for total access, but I'm looking up in our newsroom, we got all these different monitors and it's like Bristol moved to Boulder. I just, I can't get over all the hype around Prime and the attention that's there. And, and in my mind, I do think about the last what, 10, 15 years or so in the great players, whether it was Marcus, and, and obviously you guys know about all all the things that he did, you know, wearing that Ducks uniform and, um, you know, just some really great football teams, the SC teams that have done really well. And now the page is turning where you know, we always talked about parity in the league. And, and now all of a sudden you're talking about, you know, six, seven programs in the top 25, which is really a remarkable feat. And it's just disappointing, you know, when you look ahead to the next few years, these teams just not playing in the league. Yeah, it is. It, it's crazy being a West Coast guy, someone who grew up watching the Pac-10 and then the Pac-12, playing in the Pac-12, and then, you know, kind of looking at the future of it and thinking, man, where's it Where's it going to go from here? So from your perspective, you know, what you've seen, how do you see the Pac-12 moving forward? And then college football kind of in general, how do you think it moves forward from here? You know, Ryan, it's a really good question, man, because I do think about just the opportunity at stake from a college athletic standpoint, right? There's been a huge evolution. I think about my college years, the years you guys were playing at Oregon, which is not that far removed. But you talk about the portal, NIL, and now conference realignment. All of these things have been happening over a short period of time. But now you're in a situation where it's DEFCON 1 right now, right? For From Pac-12 perspective, there's two teams that are in the league. Here, here's where I net out with it. I actually do think that in a few years, the regional aspects of college athletics is going to come back. Like, I don't know if it's going to be called the PAC whatever, right? Like, I don't even know what's going to happen with Oregon State and Washington State. But I don't think that this current model is sustainable. I think it gets closer to an NFL model where you're talking about, let's just call it two you know, two major conferences that are going to be going back and forth. And then you're just going to keep teams close. So I actually think a lot of the rivalries that we've grown to love on the West Coast are going to happen again. I just don't think it's under this current model. I think the evolution continues. It's more of an NFL sort of style where it it just makes sense, strategically speaking. And I do think you get like the big non-conference or even conference games that will just be played on respective campuses. But to ask student athletes to continue to do this travel cross country or hours on flight while they're also trying to get their academics straight, I, I think is too tough of an ask. And quite frankly, I think all of this is driven by money. Like, I think if you look at the Pac-12 and how it's disintegrated, to me, there is another level of greed and quite frankly, I think arrogance, which explains why there's now two teams that are left and you're looking at this realignment. And it's really sad because it's the the fans that are affected. It's the student athletes that are getting affected who thought that they were going to play in this league. And now all of a sudden the travel is different across the board. Like there is a lot of ripple effects from, from decision, quite honestly, just a few decisions decision makers who are making the calls on some of this stuff. And that's the tragic thing about all of it. But I do think in a few years, another cycle of media rights negotiations, you're going to see schools figure out a way 
uh, and I hope it happens because it hasn't happened to this point where the collective understands the power that they actually do have. And that turns into sort of these mega conferences, two of them, maybe three of them, but we get this idea of regional, the regional aspect and those rivalries in place. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I we The joke around the office is it's going gonna, gonna to be the uh, ESPN conference and the Fox conference eventually. Yeah. Yeah. But the NFL model, it does make sense because then you could have like the Big Ten, but it's the West and it's Washington, sure. Oregon, yeah. uh, USC, UCLA. So, yeah, that totally makes sense. But, you know, going back to the Pac-12, I know it's going to be very weird watching our teams with the Big Ten logo on their chest next year. But uh, were there any like favorite moments you had, you know, favorite players you interviewed? favorite games you called when you were working for the Pac-12 Networks? Wow, Nate, put me on the spot, man. I... <laughs> so many great memories. It's it's really even hard to just focus in on one or two. I mean, I remember launch night is sort of like the big one in my head. It's, uh, you know, 2012. I had done, uh, I was struggling to get out of my contract at ESPN. So I did Sports Center on a Saturday. I left that meeting uh, our production meeting in that morning, watched my car, put it onto a trailer. That thing was getting driven cross country. Sunday morning, I was on a flight to San Francisco. Monday morning in an HR meeting, I got pulled out of the HR meeting to go down to the studios to start doing run-throughs. I mean, my audition, Nate, like there wasn't even a studio. I mean, there was wires everywhere where there was a huge staircase from the second floor to the, or excuse me, the, uh, the second floor to the third floor. Yeah. There was like a big hole in the ceiling. Like there was no staircase at that point. I mean, that's, that's the level of where it was. And then to see everything come together, we did that launch on a Wednesday night. I'll still never forget it. Coach Neuheisel and his wife, we, we finished the show. Most of it was taped because I don't think there was total trust in being able to execute a live show from a technical standpoint. So we go into our green room and, uh, you know, Rick's wife, Sue, they were kind of like my West coast parents, to be honest with you. I mean, they were so good to me over the years and we got to be real close, but Rick's wife, Sue had a, had a bottle of, um, Dom Perignon and I had never had, like, I wasn't even a champagne dude, right? Like I, you know, I was still young, like I'm still drinking, you know, beer. I still have an outgrown Captain Morgan, but besides the point. So like we got this bottle of Dom and it's, it's Coach Newhouse like gives this great speech about how winning's really hard and and you know when he was at Colorado or Washington they'd always have after their wins all the coaches' families would go over to his house and they'd take a horn off right like everyone takes a sip out of the bottle and I mean it's me it's uh, you know it's obviously Rick and Sue Ronnie Lotts in that room Glenn Parker Summer Sanders I mean it is just it's awesome right and like we all kind of take a sip and I, I think about those types of moments. Um, and like, those are the things that you just don't forget. And then just being on those campuses, like, you know, I mentioned EFO giving me a tour of, of what I call like the Starship Enterprise of, of facilities with what they have in, in Eugene, Oregon, because of Uncle Phil, but I, there's so many great athletes, the Rose Bowls, I think about being you know, a few years back when Sam Donald was, was the quarterback at SC Penn state, you know, it's come from behind victory. I'll never forget going, we were doing the show outside, but watch the game in the press box at the Rose bowl. And, and, you know, those are those experiences. I've never been at the Rose bowl until I started working at PAC 12 network and the sunset and the whole thing, the iconic nature of it. But I remember going from the press box down to the field. Cause that's where we were going to do the show. And I'm thinking we're going to lose, right? Like, you know, just they're down. It, it just, it didn't seem really like you could fathom it. And next thing you know, like they start making a run and it's, you know, Lynn Swan and Ronnie Lott and Mark Sanchez and Liner, like all these dudes are Willie McGinnis. They're all on the sideline. They're going nuts. Like these are grown men who are going berserk over this comeback and Darnold leads it. They go and win, but I'll never forget man being on the field. And you guys experience this as student athletes, right? So you're on the field and in Eugene, like it gets loud, right? Like, I mean, you can hear it and you can feel it. But unless you're an actual player on the field, and I wasn't a player, I just happened to be on the field, the intensity, like I could, I, I could feel my suit vibrating. It was so damn loud on the field. And I, I can only imagine like that intoxicating feeling that you get as an athlete and how hard it is to duplicate that on anything in your life other than on game day, right? So those are like, that was like a little glimpse of, for me, of what it was like to be an actual player. Um, and it was just one of those cool moments, but like, there's so many of them. I mean, hell, I could go on on this podcast with you guys for, you know, for days and, and hours. But, um, you know, I, I think about or like Coach Aliotti, right? Like even on the personal side, when I got let go at Pac-12, like Coach would call me in COVID. He'd be taking his walks like every single day. 
and he'd call me like all the time. And sometimes he'd leave a voicemail if I couldn't answer and it'd be like, uh, Yammer. I, this, I have like the worst, worst Coach Aliotti impression, but he'd be like, Yammer, it's Coach Al. Just checking on your melon and like hang up, you know? And like, so like all those personal connections over time, man, just, just really awesome. Yeah, that, that's definitely awesome. And, uh, you know, kind of going back to how we started, you know, your, your career path through the sports media and whatnot of all the coaches you've talked to, and, you know, you've obviously talked to NBA coaches at college basketball, college football, would you say there's a difference between basketball and football coaches and kind of how they, how they carry themselves, you know, maybe some of their sayings, things like that. Like, is there a difference between the sports? Do you think? It's a great question, Ryan. You know, I don't know if I necessarily thought about it from a coach's perspective, because like every coach has like the identity that he wants to instill with his players. Right. I always think it's more manageable in hoops because of roster size where I always felt like basketball coaches had more intimate knowledge of their players on a personal level on the hoop side than they did on the football side. And I think quite honestly, that's just a function of the roster size. I think they all wanted things to be a certain way and they're kind of meticulous about it. I do think this is a broad stroke here because it's not, it's not everyone, but I do think the football guys take football way more serious than basketball guys take basketball. Like I just, I think about that from a coach's perspective. I think from candidly, like I think about the analysts that I've worked with, man, like the football dudes, like it is life or death. And like the basketball guys, it's like lifestyle, right? Like there happens to be a basketball game going on while we're watching it. Uh, but the football dudes are like, yo, look at this guy, man. Like, yo, you can't, you can't be, you can't be making that play cover two. You can't, you know, I'm like, it's just all of like this crazy stuff talking about alignment and they, they get in the weeds on it. And I, I, I do also think, and, and Ryan, you know this too, just cause I know Nate and I were talking about you a couple weeks ago ahead of this podcast, like the inner workings of like the technical aspect that I don't think people even realize on the football side of things. You, look, and I've been at hoops practices and I will say like Dana Altman, right? Like if you want to make this an Oregon conversation, like Dana's like on it, just very, he, you know, who he reminds me of, um, this is going to, you guys are going to cringe and I don't mean to make it sound like this, but he reminds me of Chris Peterson, right? Like I, not to make the, the UW mm -hmm. reference, but I remember being in Seattle, yeah. like you'd go to the football field and coach Pete would be walking around. And if your foot like wasn't exactly where he wanted it to be. Like the direct, like, I mean, just these minute details, everything was like a coachable moment, you know, it's kind of like Dana, like, and, and I, I will say like most basketball coaches in the league, and I've been to, to quite a few practices, like not everyone was like that, but Ryan, to your point, I think football dudes just take it way too serious. Like I just, that's, that's, that's my gut. But then you watch these guys on the sideline and just going, going berserk. Hey, by the way, can I just circle back on something? Cause I just made reference to coach Peterson. You had asked me about these memories. Um, Nate, I don't know if it was you or Ryan. Like, this is me just taking over your podcast and I apologize. I'm going no, on. We love, this, we love it. Exactly <laughs> we love it. Right I'll never be invited <laughs> back. Um, <laughs> so in 2020, when I had lost my gig, I had a bunch of coaches reach out, which was, crazy to me. Like, I honestly, like you, you knew him. I just, for whatever reason, like, I just didn't think that was going to happen. Like, I didn't even think like, Oh, I hope they call him. Like, it just wasn't even in my head. I was so worried about like, damn, am I ever going to get a job again? And I'll never forget this. I had a bunch of coaches call. Peterson calls me. I hadn't talked to him on the phone before. I didn't even know. He, I think he got my number from Yogi and, uh, coach calls me and he's like, Hey, you know, I'm like, yeah, it's coach Peterson. Just wanted to reach out. Every coach that I talked to was like, just a couple minutes, like two, three minutes. Hey man, thinking about you, you're a pro, appreciate you. Like, you know, best of luck. If we can help, let us know. Great. And it meant the world to me, those calls that I got. Peterson calls and he's like, how are you doing? You know, and I'm like, hey, I'm a good coach. And like, I'm not giving long answers. So I'm like, all right, like, you know, I appreciate it. It means a ton. It's going to be like a two minute conversation. 10 minutes in, I'm like, yo, he's like really talking. Like we're having like a real conversation. We're on the phone for over an hour, man. Um, the best pep talk in the history of pep talks is what he gave me. But, you know, it also speaks to, and once again, like I'm sure there's Oregon fans that listen to this podcast predominantly and they're like, dude, shut the hell up on Coach Peterson in Washington. But I do think about 
his program. Cause you know, Ryan, you're asking about how serious some of these guys take it. And, you know, coach Pete would always talk about like built for life, right? Like everyone, like when the day was, you know, when Helfrich was there, you know, I remember that from an Oregon perspective, but he's telling me all these stories and just making me think differently about career path and next moves. Um, one of the most meaningful conversations I had in what was probably the toughest time of my career. Um, so, you know, when we talk about relationships and missing, you know, the league, I, that's what I think about, like those personal things that have happened over, you know, what was basically a 10 year span when I got to the network and, and when I was gone. Yeah, that's, that's an awesome story. I know. Yeah, you're right. We have mostly duck fans who listen, but, uh, coach Pete, he does good work on, uh, on Saturdays, you know, calling games. So now moving on NFL. Now the host of Helfrich, total access way, call too, which yes, and he yes. was a few years <laughs> gone from the league. So that, that was one of the special calls as well. So I'm trying to get back in the good graces of ducks. Fans. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. But yeah, like we were saying, NFL host of the total access, N not a bad job to kind of yeah. land back on your feet, Mike. Uh, yeah, talk to us a little bit how, you know, the transition between college and NFL, kind of the big differences you see uh, when it comes to not only like calling those games, but, you know, just analyzing it from like a, you know, prof professional point of view. You know, it's funny, and I was actually just talking about this uh, last week in one of our meetings for Total Access. Michael Robinson, who is now on the NBC crew, so M. Rob does obviously NFL Network with us, but he's been doing the Big Ten um, for NBC. And I gave him you know, basically two, three weeks, and I said, "Hey, Mike, I want to ask you a question about what you're seeing on the weekends because it's a big adjustment." I remember when Liner was doing stuff at Pac-12 Network; he's coming off an NFL career. Like it's hard. Joey Galloway, I had him early when he was at ESPN, like these dudes are NFL dudes. Now all of a sudden you're throwing them into the college ranks where there's major turnover in terms of personnel every few years, just because of the, the nature of, you know, being in college and it's tough, man. And, and, and those guys have really crushed it and they did their homework and, you know, now they're at, at this elite level. But I said, M Rob, you know, for me now, the last couple of years watching mostly NFL, you know, I, I turn a game on and I'm like, oh my God, like it feels different. And I said, Emra, are you noticing like when you watch these games, just how much slower it is? And he was like a thousand percent, like the speed aspect and an execution standpoint is just vastly different from Saturday ball to Sunday ball. And to take it a step further and, and Ryan, you were asking about hoops. I remember being with Casey Jacobson obviously a great shooter in his own right when, when he was at Stanford and Don McLean, I had this conversation with Don as well, former UCLA great, still the leading scorer in, in conference history, by the way. And I, we were, we, I forget where we were. We were at some, maybe it was in Vegas for a conference tournament. And these dudes are in warm ups and they're shooting around and whichever player was good three point shooter in the league at that time, just bearing triple, 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 triple. And I'm like, damn, man, that's pretty good. Then I started covering, um, I, I had a stint with tune in to do some NBA stuff. I'm at uh, practice for the warriors, bro. It's not the same. It's not the same. And granted hard comp because I, you know, I mentioned warriors and the first thing anyone thinks about Steph Curry, who literally blindfolded could have outshot probably the dude that I was talking about hitting triple after triple, but it's the execution is just different. Like, it's almost like in a practice, you're surprised when a guy misses a shot. It feels like that, where when you watch college kids, you're like, oh, is he going to hit? Like, you're still kind of on the edge of your seat a little bit. And on the pro side, like, it's just, it's a different, different monster. Yeah, that's, that's a great comparison. I think that definitely, definitely portrays the difference between uh, the Saturdays and Sundays, like you said, but you know, Mike, this has been great having you on. You know, we'll uh, give you a plug for your book real quick. Everyone, if you're listening and you enjoy Mike and all the stuff he does, uh, go buy his book right now, Fried Rice and Marinara, out. Um, if you want to give a quick little synopsis of sure, that, man. go for it so people can uh, go buy that. Well, Ryan, I appreciate it, man. And it's it's so crazy to me because you started by talking about, like, the broadcast journey. And, you know, I spent my, basically my entire career telling the stories of athletes, right. And like definitely comfortable on that side. Um, but it dawned on me a few years ago, especially when I had some time during COVID, you know, there just wasn't 
you know, if I think back to my childhood, right, like there's these books and I'm sure Ryan and Nate, like I could ask you like, Hey, what were the books that your parents read to you? Like you, you probably could tell me what they are. And I still remember, like I had a book, Superman book. I had my mom read that to me like a billion times. Um, my dad's a cyto, uh, uh, cytologist, which is really the study of cells. And, um, so I had a book, a Snoopy book about cells and learning about, you know, nucleuses and, and mitochondria and the whole thing. Um, but there really wasn't a story that I ever had as a kid that had an Asian character that had someone that was um, mixed race. I'm Chinese and Italian and, and really fried rice and marinara is the story of Mikey, who's Chinese and Italian. It's his fourth birthday. And his mom says, what do you want? What's the food you want for your birthday party? And he's like, I have no idea. Like, I don't know if I have Chinese food. I don't know if I'm supposed to have Italian food. And he feels like he's getting pulled in a couple different directions and he goes to his grandmother's and his Chinese grandmother's like, Oh, Hong Kong, we had Chinese food, Italy. Oh, we had Italian food. So, you know, it's not really helping one of his friends like, yo, you're Chinese and Italian, man, you can have both. And he decides to, to have fried rice and marinara and he combines them. Um, and Ryan, you'd be shocked, man. Like, the kids loved it. Um, not to be spoiler <laughs> alert here, but the kids at the birthday party loved it. But it's it's available on Amazon and on BarnesandNoble.com and, and really just a huge passion project for me. So I appreciate both you guys, you know, giving me some support here and, and mentioning it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, before we let you go, though, we're going to need a prediction out of you. Who is going to win the Pac-12 this year? <laughs> know your audience, man. Go Ducks. Here it is. So, um <laughs> You know, I will say, man, Dan's got these guys rolling right now. Like, I, I had some questions. Um, you know, I felt really comfortable about Bo Nix heading into the season. Um, but generally speaking, and, and you guys would know better than most, I, from a wide receiving core, like, over the years, compared to some of the other teams in the league, I always kind of felt like, mm, you know, just sometimes the execution – wasn't always there and uh you know so i think to me and it wasn't like a lack of recruiting too like i think if you look at some of those players right like just a bunch of four and five star dudes and and it didn't always necessarily equal production at that elite level compared to some of the other schools but i think the domination and destruction of Colorado um, over the weekend. And I don't know when you guys are going to air this podcast, but obviously that's the game that we're coming off of. So we'll see if, if things sort of change over the next few weeks. But to me, I think that was such a huge statement, not only for the rest of the league so that they could flex, but also just kind of a reminder of like, yo, we're really good. And I think a year ago with Dan trying to figure things out as a head coach, you're seeing the in execution that I think is a little bit different um, this season compared to last year. So I do feel cautiously optimistic about this this Oregon team. And look, I get, I know Caleb is down at SC and, and Utah is still Utah, um, but I think there's a nice blend on this roster. SC, I don't think can boast, you know, strong a strong defense, which was obviously one of the major questions we had about them coming in. But um, to me, I think Oregon's got just as good a chance as anyone in this league, and I would certainly put them in the in the top two or top three of of my educated guesses. Should I just go on record and just say Ducks? Like, would <laughs> it's, should I just go? Just I'll just say it and just say yeah. Let's, I mean, yes, we're not. Game. We're not, yeah, we're not going to press you into saying anything, you know, but Mike Yam did say the Ducks are going to win the Pac-12 championship this we're, year. So. We're, we're in. <laughs> I, I'll co-sign on that. And I loved up Washington and Chris Peterson enough. So we don't, you yeah. know, like that team's, they're, they're rolling too. So, yeah, um, I will but, say I'm scared of them a little bit, especially yeah, that, man. uh, the date we have in mid-October at Washington, that will be a, and coming from a former player, I think I'm more nervous watching the game than actually playing. So I will say I'm a little nervous for that game. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, can I ask you guys real quick here? Like, how proud no. are you guys of Justin Herbert? Like, is that like the coolest thing for you guys to see like that type of success? It's it's right, even a little you, yeah. it's even a little crazier for me, you know, because I played high school football with him. You know, I've known Justin since we were in elementary school. So it it is like yeah i'm i'm beyond proud of him you know it's awesome to be able to watch him every sunday and you know know that he's one of the best if not the best quarterback in the national football league you know one of the you know one of the premier guys every sunday when you turn your tv on you know just just a kid from eugene and you know it's it's obvious that he hasn't changed in any way you know still super humble and hungry and um, you know, just all that, you know, makes, makes it even more awesome to, to be able to say that, you know, you knew that, yeah. you know, that guy and you grew up with him and you know, all that. It's yeah. wild, man. It's wild. It, it, it's kind of surreal seeing like our friends play in the league. Cause to us, they're just, you know, like our buddies, you know, we kind of yeah. became men with them at Oregon and 
Like, I, I remember I was at the uh, Dolphins and Chargers game where Verone and Javon were facing off against Justin, and they were all on the field at the same time. I was like, this is, is this real life? Like, it's and I'm just crazy. sitting in the stands. I'm just, this is so crazy. It's it's so wild to me, man. Like, so he signs that huge deal, and then a week or two late, it might have been a week later, we were down there. It was me and LaDainian Tomlinson. We were doing our show for NFL Network mm-hmm. um, in Costa Mesa at practice, and then Justin comes over after practice, and he sits down with us. I mean, it was, aw- like, I'm legitimately, you know, it's weird, because you know, you see these dudes on Sundays and I think getting to know a lot of these players, um, you know, when they were in the league in the PAC 12, you know, you just, there's like a sense of pride that you have. And when you see them doing well, like uh, legitimately happy, I'm like, yo. And then like, I'm thinking to myself, like, just like, where you take me out to dinner? Like you're paying, right? Like that's gotta be a thing. And then by the way, Nick, you mentioned Verone, like he was out here in, um, in Southern California. I think it was, they were, uh, matching up against the Rams. Um, or maybe it was Chargers. Anyway, point is, so they're down here, and that's coming off of, I think it was Rams, because I think they, they lost to San Francisco. He comes down here mm-hmm. and, like, Hank came to the studio for, like, a couple hours and, like, you know, showed him. He came on the podcast, um, the Total Access podcast. You know, it's just kind of cool to still keep tabs on a lot of these guys, you know, who obviously thrived on, on Saturdays and are, you know, making a living out of it on Sundays. It's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty surreal. Yeah. But yeah, uh, thanks again, Mike. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, one of our more high-profile guests, and you know, maybe we'll get a we'll get a NFL playoff prediction recap from you. You know, Done. when that time Done. comes, we'll have you on again. Hundred percent. I'd be disappointed if I don't get another invite. And uh, and like I said, man, it's great to see both of you dudes. And and um, please, Ryan, make sure you tell Coach Crystal Ball I said what's up. Um, definitely miss being around him, and and looking forward to chatting with you guys real soon. Yes, right. sir. Will we appreciate do. it, Mike. Appreciate it, Mike. Appreciate it.